graduating Bachelor of Social Work senior at Coppin State University. She is an honor student and a Maxi Collier Fellow. Faith plans to attend University of Maryland School of Social Work to pursue her master's in social work. A fun fact about her is that she and Fanny Jackson Coppin share the same birthday. Miracle Jordan is a graduating biology major with a pre-med concentration. As an active member of, of the Epsilon Kappa chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, since her initiation in fall 2023, Miracle has demonstrated a strong commitment to sisterhood and service. As a public health chair of the Coppin State chapter of NAACP, she leads initiatives to address health disparities and promote wellness within the community. With aspirations to break chains and general barriers, Miracle is driven to become the first doctor in her family. Now, Dr. Umar has a very, very extensive biography consisting of accolades such as psychiatrist and author. But when I was speaking to him backstage before the event, he said, you don't even have to say all that. He said, just refer to me as King Kong Consciousness and say that I am here. <laughs> so, without further ado, it is my pleasure to now invite to the stage Faith Miracle and our guest speaker for this evening, Dr. Umar Ipatunde. How 
can you then turn around and use the same provision created to give black people an opportunity and now use it to take opportunity away from black people? So they are trying to gentrify not only the PWI of black students, but they want to gentrify the HBCUs of black students. And so we have to stick together, we have to continue to support the HBCUs, and we cannot let them die because our ancestors found these institutions coming out of slavery and beyond to give us an opportunity. And if we let the HBCU die, we will die. And right now, we're witnessing a rollback in the civil rights games that our ancestors fought for. And I think that one of the reasons we're witnessing this rollback is we as American Africans, we have stopped fighting. We have gotten lazy. We have gotten politically tired. We have fallen in love with American materialism and we forgot who we were and who we are as a people. And now is the time for us to refocus, get back on the grind, because as the Honorable Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there will be no progress. Okay, so our next question is, as a doctor of clinical psychology and certified school psychologist, you have a wealth of knowledge on mental health. In recent years, we have seen the mental health of black people come under attack due to systemic issues like police brutality, public health access, and Systemic racism. What are the most harmful contributions to the mental health crisis faced by black people today? Great question. Black people and mental health. First of all, racism is the number one cause of mental health crisis in the black community. I don't care if you suffer from an addiction. I don't care if you suffer from borderline or bipolar. I don't care if you suffer from anxiety or depression. I don't care if you are bulimic, I don't care if you're dealing with grief, burnout, suicidality, homicidality, black on black, collective self genocide, racism is always the primary cause of all mental health issues in the black community. Now, people often argue why don't more black people see treatment? The reason why more black people do not see treatment is the very system of mental health in America the American Psychological Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the uh, Food and Drug Administration, the National Institute of Mental Health, they created the racism that black people suffer from. If you go back in the history of this country, it was the psychologists who said black people were inferior to white people. It was the psychologists who advocated that our women get sterilized and our men get castrated. It was the psychologists who came up with this racially biased IQ test that I have to give as a school psychologist that does not matter in measure intelligence, it only measures cultural familiarity. It was the psychologist who came up with separate but equal, not only in America, if you go to psychologists, excuse me, if you go to South Africa, who created the system of apartheid in South Africa? A psychologist. You go to London, who created the system of white supremacy in London? A psychologist. You go to Adolf Hitler's uh, Nazi Germany, who created the system of uh, the superior race or the master race in Hitler's Germany? It was a white psychologist, so how can we expect black people to go to the same white people who caused our problems to solve them? Now, I want to go a step deeper with your question, Queen, because it's a good one. <laughs> Couple, four variables. Number one, the reason why we're, we have so much mental health illness is black people have bought into the hypnosis of American capitalism. And the hypnosis of American capitalism says black people judge happiness and life satisfaction based on how we look and what we own. And so we could be very depressed, very suicidal, very filled with uh, hate and anger, but on the outside, I got a Mercedes. On the outside, I got a Louis bag. On the outside, I got Balenciaga. On the outside, we have all these expensive yet useless European-made goods. And we're told that as long as you got that degree, as long as you got some money, as long as you got nice clothing, you're supposed to be happy and healthy. And that is not the case because as African people, profoundly, we are spiritual beings. And so any mental health modality that's going to help us address our issues 
must start with the soul. The problem with starting with the soul, princess, is European psychology does not admit the existence of spirit. So how do you help a people whose very essence is based on the spirit when you don't acknowledge the existence of one? And that is why we are making a bad mistake imitating Caucasians, because who leads America and has led America in suicide risk in this country? Middle-aged white men. So the very men we're trying to compete with, the very men we're trying to emulate and be, the very men that so many black women will give their lives to marry, Buddy Hopper, the very men <laughs> are leading this country and taking their own life. So something has to be said about the cancer of capitalism, that's one. Number two, we have to go back to our ancestral foundation. We as African people, we have always believed in communication with the other world because we believe we exist in both worlds simultaneously. And one of the supports we have are our ancestors, but unfortunately, the world religions of Islam, Christianity, and the Hebrew faith have stripped African people of our right to communicate with our ancestors. And we're gonna to have to reacclimate ourselves to that because there's a lot of healing that can take place spiritually when we tap into that long ancestral lineage that we come from. The third point is our individualism and selfishness. And this will be the last one on this question. Individualism and selfishness. What do I mean by that? As African people, we are a communal people. I am because we are. We rise together or we don't rise at all. But again, copying Caucasians. We have bought into this Eurocentric mindset of me, myself, and I. We no longer ascribe to Ubuntu. And because we no longer ascribe to the principle of divine oneness as a people, we see our race of suicide going up. We see black on black, black men killing each other on the streets every day. We see black women who never had a suicide problem in American history now have the fastest growing suicide rates because we need each other to win this. The entire America is against black people. And not just white, every color is against black people. So if we want to win this, we got to win it together. So the solution to the mental health crisis facing the black community, because the number one cause of death for young black men is homicide. And the number two leading cause of death for young black men is suicide. And the third leading cause of death for young black men is preventable injuries. So the top three reasons black men are dying are completely preventable. We can do something about that. But again, a lot less materialism and a lot more spirituality. A lot less individualism and a lot more collectivity. Okay? And a lot less reliance on European structures of success and a return to what we as African people consider to be a success. In essence, go back to who we are and stop trying to be who we could never want to be. Black power. Thank you. Our next question. Um, can you talk about ways in which black mental health professionals can decolonize mental health in the black community? Decolonize. Okay. Here's the thing. In order for black mental health professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, licensed professional counselors, a behavioral specialist, in order for us to decolonize mental health in the black community, three things have to be dealt with. Number one, we have to build our own institutions. I want to be very clear about something. And I want all you young students here, Coppin State University, and of course my Baltimore family, to understand. Half of our solutions as African people are the institutions. We have to build our own. We cannot keep trying to reform racist white institutions while we spend $30 billion on weed and perms and $2 billion on Air Jordans and $4 billion on liquor and $800 million on chicken, turkey, beef, and pork. Stop wasting all this money and build our own institutions. But because black people don't believe in weaponizing our money to further our political arrangement, we would rather fight white people 
for what we need and spend our money on what we want. That is completely backwards. You know, one thing that is common, and not to get off topic here because I want to answer this question, but one thing that is very common is I travel the world, right? And I was just in uh, the Netherlands not too long ago. I was in uh, England, I was in Belgium, I was in Guadeloupe, I was in Jamaica not too long ago, Barbados. And you know what I find? Wherever you go in the world, and I'll be going to Panama, I was in Panama not too long ago, looking forward to going to Costa Rica for the most honorable Marcus Garvey's solar return. But one of the things you find wherever you go is our economy is dominated by non-African people. Nowhere in the world are black people in charge of the black dollar. Nowhere. How are we going to solve our problems if we cannot control our money? Our money goes to other people's community that they weaponize and come back and use it against us. So we are committing economic suicide as much as we are committing biological suicide. So number one, mental health practitioners have to build our own institutions so we can create or implement our own mental health treatment modalities. Because we have the Association of Black Psychologists, they have it. The Association of Black Social Workers and Therapists, they have it. The problem is what? They're fighting white people to let us implement African-centered approaches to treatment in white-funded institutions. White people are not going to do that. So if we're going to treat black people the way black people need to be healed, we got to own those institutions. But that's a big problem, you know why? Black people don't believe in building their own institutions. We believe in moving into white people's neighborhoods. We believe in sending our kids to white people's schools. We believe in going to white people's colleges and white people's supermarkets and white people's hospitals. We don't want anything black. We don't even want anything sleeping in the bed with us that's black, you understand? We always want to go out. So number one, build your own institutions. Number two, in order for mental health practitioners to be effective, healing our people, decolonizing, we have to be advocates. We, have, we cannot just do therapy. I have to treat the world that you live in. Because if you can't find a good job, how am I going to alleviate your depression? If you live in a poor housing, how am I going to alleviate your depression? If your husband is a domestic abuser, and we don't do something about the domestic abuse against black women in the black community, how can I help you? See, the hypocrisy of white psychology is they make the scapegoat for all your problems because they're never going to address the white power structure that introduced every variable of dysfunction in your life. They're never going to touch that. They're not going to talk about how racist the criminal justice system is and how that's affecting your well-being. They're not going to talk about how racist your child's public school system is and that's why you're dealing with depression and anxiety. They're never going to address the systems. They're going to scapegoat the systems and blame you. And that's why white mental health is a complete hypocrisy because it doesn't advocate for the client to change the systems that's creating the problems. Yeah. You want to help black men feel better about themselves? Give them a livable wage job. You see, so we have to deal with the concrete changes and not just the philosophical ideas. Thank you, that was very insightful, honestly. Um, for a follow up question, Cindy. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> Do you believe that racial trauma should be a diagnosis included in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual? Absolutely. The DSM, racial trauma, post-traumatic slavery disease, post-traumatic ghetto disorder, <laughs> post-traumatic bunny hopper syndrome. I think there's so many mental health crises that need to be included in the DSM. But they're not. And you know why not? Psychiatry and psychology as a branch of medicine has a responsibility of defining normal and abnormal behavior. If the racist personality was considered a diagnosable condition, white people would have to be held mentally ill when they practice racism. If white people were deemed mentally ill for practicing racism, do you know how many white people would be forced out of their jobs for being racist? 
So they can never indict racism because it would upset the status quo of this society. The job of psychology is to referee the behavior of racism's victims so that the victim is always perceived to be the one who is dysfunctional vis-a-vis -vis the institution. See, in America, we never diagnose the institutions. We diagnose the victims of the institution. So they will never say anything about how unhealthy their prison is, but they will diagnose the prisoner. They will never do anything about the ghetto and diagnose how unhealthy the ghetto is, but they will diagnose the people who live in it. Why won't they diagnose the prison system? Why won't they diagnose the criminal injustice system? Why won't they diagnose the mass incarceration system? Because institutions can be ill just like individuals, but they will never diagnose them. Why? Because that puts responsibility on the white power structure for creating the reality we live in. And the purpose of psychology is to scapegoat us for those problems and not to hold the system accountable. I'll give you a quote from the Kerner Commission, 1967. Lyndon Baines Johnson put together a commission to study the cause of the riots that took place in America in 1967. So the year before America murdered King, there were over 100 race riots. America was burning. Detroit and Newark, New Jersey had the two most significant race riots, all right? But there were over 100. So Lyndon Baines Johnson said, find out why these black people are turning up like this, right? And the Kerner Commission report came back a few months before they murdered Dr. King. And what did those white men say on that presidential uh, commission? They said, what black America can never forget, and what white America, and I'm quoting by this is a quote, what black America can never forget, and what white America does not understand, is that racist white institutions are deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created the ghetto, White institutions maintain the ghetto, and white institutions condone the ghetto. That is a direct quote from the Kerner Commission. And guess how President Lyndon Baines Johnson dealt with that Kerner Commission? He refused to acknowledge it. He was so angry at the Kerner Commission for telling the truth about racism in America. And the Kerner Commission report is partly the reason Dr. King was assassinated on April the 4th, because they were afraid that if Dr. King had this information, this data, from the president's office before he led the breadbasket campaign to Washington, D.C., he would be unstoppable. So one of the reasons Dr. King died on April 4th is they couldn't afford for him to show up in Washington, D.C. with the Kerner Commission report. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convince black people racism no longer exists. Question. <laughs> Our campus is in West Baltimore, a geographic area that has been plagued by redlining and gentrification. Can you talk about the housing crisis faced by black people in the United States? How do you think this impacts college students and what are the possible solutions? Great question. Number one. The ghettos were created by the power structure, as I just mentioned. The Federal Housing Administration played a big role in redlining and creating ghettos because when black people started moving into the major cities back in the 1930s, white people started moving to the suburbs, but white people couldn't afford to pay the mortgages out there. So the government subsidized loans for poor, broke white people to get houses in these suburbs. I need y'all to know this. Because when y'all drive through the suburbs outside of Baltimore, y'all think these white people worked hard and paid off the mortgage. No, they got welfare from the federal government to get them houses in the suburbs. And then when black people tried to also escape the ghetto and get a mortgage, an FHA loan, they told them, we can't give them to y'all because your credit is not good enough. And then when black people said, well, if I got to stay in the ghetto in Baltimore, Philadelphia, Detroit, Milwaukee, then let me buy a house in the ghetto. And they said, we cannot under, 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 underwrite a, a, a loan in the ghetto either. So they stopped black people from becoming homeowners. And they stopped the black people from becoming homeowners. And in 1930s and 1940s, the US government deliberately created the wealth gap 
in the black community because one of the quickest ways to build wealth is to own real estate and own property. Most millionaires in America became millionaires through real estate. So America, in effect, kept black people propertyless while they made broke white people home owners, and those white people intergenerationally were able to transfer that wealth down to their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and that's why we have the wealth disparity in America today. You're not lazy. White people are just racist. <laughs> now, here's where I'm gonna hold some of, some of our celebrities accountable. Because most white businesses, major white businesses, get their funding through private equity. That means they go to rich white people to get funding. They don't go to Wells Fargo and Bank of America, Citizens. They go to white people, and white people fund their own people to build businesses. Why do our basketball players do that? Why don't our gangster rappers do that? Why don't our NFL and c c comics and actors and dancers do that? If white people are growing white wealth by investing in everyday white people, why aren't black celebrities doing the same? For two reasons. Three, number one, they don't care. Because they were not raised to care. Let me be honest, because I don't want to scapegoat the black celebrity. Most of you, if you were given an opportunity to sell your people out for some money, you would take it too. Let's just be honest. Half of us belong to the Legion of Coons. And we need to be honest. Okay, let's be honest. Let's be honest. Okay? As great as Coppin State is as an HBCU, some of you wanted to go to PWI and didn't get in. Let's be honest. You didn't choose black power. You wanted to be the white power, but they didn't let you in. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. HBCU wasn't your first choice. You wanted to be one of the talented Tim. Let's be honest. You wanted to be a black bourgeoisie at Princeton. Let's be honest. So with that, when I look at the fact that Queen Mother Sister Oprah is the richest woman in the history of the North American continent and hasn't built a single institution for black people. When I look at the billionaires of LeBron and the billionaires of Tiger Woods and he's still bunny hopping even after he gave that birth wife a billion dollars. But when I look at the Rihannas and the Serena Williams of the world, when I look at the Bob Johnsons of the world and I'm gonna leave Puffy out of it, but when I look at this, I wish they would create a stream of wealth, of equity, of access to capital. They don't have to give us nothing. Just create the bank, create the credit union with some of your wealth. Let us borrow from that and then repay the loan. In other words, their wealth doesn't diminish at all because it's reciprocal. Whatever we take, we put back in. But most of our black celebrities are only interested in imitating white social life. You understand? And they don't want to lose their access to white life. So Oprah, Oprah don't need no more money. Ain't nothing nobody can do to her. But Oprah loves getting invited to those private parties. She loves being a part of those private, you know, get-togethers. And because our black billionaires have created a social life that values access to white existence, they cannot invest in us because they will be accused of looking too black. And looking too black is not good in show business because white people don't support black people who try to help other black people. Yeah. So that means we have to do it. And I don't want to scapegoat the black celebrities again because we are a what, everybody? Two trillion dollars people. We the richest group of Africans in the world. We don't need Oprah, although it would help us. We don't need Jay-Z or Beyonce, although it would help us. We have enough capital. Who built the Honorable Marcus Garvey's movement? Poor blacks. 
Who financed Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement? Poor blacks. Who financed the Freedom Riders? Poor blacks. Who financed the city? Who financed the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Who financed the Black Panther Party of yesterday? It was everyday blacks. If we did it then, we can do it now. But in order to do that, you're going to have to rearrange your value system, your political principles, and you're going to have to stop wasting money. Will Smith, my Philadelphia brother, said something that was very profound. He coons a lot, but he said something very profound. And Brother Will said, black people spend too much money buying things you do not need to impress people you don't even like. Too much of the black dollar is spent on entertainment and appearances. I want you to look at how you spent your money the last 30 days. I promise you, after you paid your bills, the bulk of your disposable income, I don't care if you're 21, 41, or 61, most of your disposable income went on how you look and enjoying yourself. But we ain't got no black hospitals we can call our own. We ain't got no black supermarkets. Our children ain't got no good schools that they can go to. We ain't really got no banks giving out a line of credit. We ain't got no manufacturing sector. We ain't got no distribution. But you wasted all your money on feeling good and looking good. If we don't stop acting like children, white people are going to come into the black community and play your adopted parents. We need to get serious, and we need to get serious quick. My Coppin State students, I don't care what your major is. Every one of you better get a real estate license. Listen, start studying for the real estate. You don't need a college degree to get a real estate license. You can study for your real estate exam while you're right now in undergrad at Coppin State. In one year, you'll be ready to pass the Maryland or whatever state you live in, the Maryland real estate exam, and now you can start flipping properties and flipping houses. Get into real estate because it's the most comfortable way to live. Residual income, get into the real estate. I need to start thinking about that now. Take some classes on stocks and investing. Y'all need to start getting into that right now because no matter what you major in, one thing we all want to major in after we graduate, after you graduate, is entrepreneurship. There's no more jobs in America. You're going to have to make your job. You're a nursing major, you're going to open a clinic. You're a pre-med, you're going to open a hospital. You're an engineer, psychologist, you're going to have your own firm. Whatever your major is, you better think about how you want to flip this into a business that you can sustain. Because begging white people to give you a job to pay your bills is over with. Thank you. What's our next question? What role can accomplice and non-black communities play in supporting and amplifying the voices of black people in their quest for social, economic, and political equality? Really, the question is, do black people need accomplices? Accomplices. That's something like somebody committed a crime. Uh, you mean allies. Allies. OK, let me say this. And I'm going to be as brutally honest as I can because I must. Black people don't have any friends. You don't have no allies. You don't have no accomplices. You are on your own. Nobody in this country is thinking about helping black people. Not the red people, not the white people, not the brown people, not the yellow people. Multiculturalism was nothing but a psychological game of propaganda played on black people who've been hypnotized by religion to not consider color when you make your political decisions. Everything is racial in this country, and everything is political. And the only people who don't understand that everything is racial and political are Negroes, because you've been hypnotized by religion. And I'm not against religion, but we have to be honest. Religion, post-slavery, has rocked black people into a coma of believing that somehow Jesus, Moses, and Muhammad are going to solve your problems. They're not. You're going to solve them, or those problems will not be solved. You know what Napoleon Bonaparte said about religion? And I'm no fan of that white supremacist. But Napoleon Bonaparte said, religion is what keeps the poor man from killing the rich one. We have to understand the conditioning, the anti-revolutionary spirit that religion brings into our community. We don't have no allies. And for people who wants to disagree with that, Name me a Caucasian who has ever walked the earth 
that tried to eliminate white privilege. Now, you could give me a Caucasian who fought against poverty. You could give me a Caucasian who fought against homelessness in the black community. You can name a Caucasian who fought against police brutality. You can name a Caucasian that fought against mass incarceration. But guess what? Every one of those white people who fought to eliminate those problems in black existence, at the end of the day, they go home to a privileged white community. They never trade in their privileges to be treated equal with us. We need to understand something black, Baltimore. All white people are racist. And when I say that, I want to qualify it because of the history. Your white girlfriend is a racist too, ninja. Listen. Listen! The reason we don't understand racism, Black Baltimore, is because we confuse racism with bigotry. Racism is not bigotry. To be a bigot, you have to be a racist, but you can be a racist without being a bigot. A bigot is someone who hates you because you're black. They believe you are inferior. They call you the N-word under their breath. They're contemptuous in your presence. They hate everything black and are committed to destroying black excellence. They have an emotional commitment to black people's failure. Not every white person has an emotional commitment to black people's failure. Only the bigot. Most white people are just racist. They're not bigots. And do you know what that means? That means they don't hate you. They don't dislike you. They eat your food. They date your men. They live in your neighborhood. They join your sororities. They join your fraternities. Yeah. Money happening in the divine nine. But anyway, let me stay, let's stay focused. We must stay focused. We must stay focused, my brothers. Listen! Listen! In order to be a racist, you believe in three things. Or should I say one thing divided three ways, and that is complete control complete domination, complete monopolization of three things, resources, opportunities, and privileges. If you know of a Caucasian on the planet who does not want white people to forever control the resources, the opportunities, and the privileges, show me who they are. All white people want to control resources, opportunities, and privileges. And the problem with you is you think because they like black culture, they're not racist. The best racists love black culture. They want watermelon, they want chicken, they want black cookies. And you know what's so sad? Is we let these Caucasians come into the black community. Play black on the weekend. They come to your clubs, sex up your women, wear their pants sagging, $60,000 cheap with the rims on it. And we say, yo, they ain't down. They're not down. They are basically humiliating you to your face. How do you let somebody come into your community, play black, and then go back to being white when they get tired of it? You are black forever. You can't take no break. And this is why I got a problem with these house Negro gangster rappers who will call Eminem the goat of hip hop. Hip hop is a black art, black culture. You don't ever give another culture the right to implement one of their own to sit on top of a culture you create. I ain't got nothing against Eminem, but we don't need no white Jesus savior in hip hop. And we don't need no white Jesus savior, DJ Khaled. He come into the black community and make music and sell all them albums, but his child don't go to no black school. He don't live in no black community. He ain't doing nothing to help out black America, but this is because we're so sick and pathetic. We always look for white people to love us. We always look for white people to want us. And because we got this low racial self-esteem, complex post-traumatic slavery disease, you can come into the black community, rob us, exploit us, laugh in our face, and as long as you smile at us, we will accept you as family. You can take the slave out of slavery, but until the slave takes the slave out of himself, 
you will never be free. Let me say this, Maryland, and my ancestors are from Maryland. Frederick Douglass is my full time great grand cousin. Listen to this. Listen to this. We can talk about fighting racism all day long. But guess what? If you don't defeat the Caucasian living inside of you, because everybody in here got a Caucasian living. Yes! Public school made it so. White media made it so. Slavery, one of the things that we do is psychology. Black psychology 101 is we got to make sure every black person recognizes it, that you have a demon in your soul. And in order for you to liberate black consciousness, in order for us to be born again, we got to exercise the demon of white supremacy. And if there's a white supremacy demon in the black community, that automatically means that there's an inferiority complex in black people. We can play with it, ignore it, lie about it, but until you crush yourself in, until you dismiss the demon of Caucasian energy inside your spirit, we will never be free. The greatest enemy we got is not the white power structure on the outside, it's the white power structure living on the inside. If you don't stop with them ad libs, that good. Simply wanting them to see 
that if we allow our children to be introduced into that mindset and lifestyle at an early age, it's no different than practicing group genocide. Because two women can't make a baby. And two men can't make a baby. And when I look at all the unmarried black women I know, professional and unprofessional, when I look at all the elderly women who come and support Dr. Umar at my lectures around the world, and they go home without a baby. I look at all the 70 and 80 year old mothers who want to die in that house without somebody to hold their hand. I have to stand up and be against the behavior, not you black man, but against the behavior because if we want to save the black community, we got to save the black family. And the only way we can save the black family is to save black on black heterosexual love. Thank you. Do you think it's a coincidence that when you look at all the movies now, it's either a same gender love or an interracial love? You think it's a coincidence? All the commercials, nearly every commercial you see, same gender or interracial. Why don't we see that for the Asian American community? Why we don't see that in the East Indian American community? Why we don't see that for the Native American community? Why we don't see that for the Latino or Anglo-Saxon or Jewish American community? Why is it only in the black community, the commercials, same gender or interracial? Because they're trying to program our babies. And I need y'all to understand something. If a little girl at eight says, I want to be a lesbian, I want to love another woman, and her parents allow her to get sexual reassignment surgery as a child, if she grows up and comes into the consciousness of who she really is as a divine African woman, if she decides, I'm going to go back to being what God made me, guess what? They can't put your ovaries back, sweetheart. When that boy decides he wants to become a woman, Zion Wade, and he decides when he gets 30, I want to be a man again, guess what? They can't put your testicles back, bro. Once they take them out, they're going for life. I want y'all to see that they are committing mass genocide in the black community under the disguise of the rainbow agenda. I just need y'all to see that. I don't hate nobody, but I love black people. So that's the LGBT. And let's be honest to my beautiful lesbian sisters who I love so much. Stay with me. I want to be honest. You're talking to a therapist. I know this. You know why I'm not hard on my sisters? practice the lesbianism, although I disagree with you. It's because most of our women who go to lesbianism go to lesbianism as a result of domestic and sexual abuse. They go to lesbianism because of how black men have treated them. I know it! Because women tell me from every age. So do you know what that means, brothers? If we would treat our women the way they deserve to be treated, if we would respect black women the way black women deserve to be respected, we could do a lot to control that type of energy trickling down to our daughters. In other words, a lot of our queens who date within their gender just need a real good relationship with a strong heterosexual black man. And once! <laughs> You get the power of a real man, spiritually, psychologically, in other ways. He will shock you right on back to your original African self. Oh, yes! Consciousness over the place. Politics over the place. Revolution over the romance. And institutions over the intimacy. Lesbian sisters, I love you. We want to get it together. Frederick Douglass, Marcus Garvey Academy. Don't you find it interesting that a black community that builds almost no important institutions for itself? We don't have no black Wall Street in America. Nowhere you go in this country can you find an independent black bank, independent black school, independent black hospital, independent black supermarket. 
supermarket to feed the people, bank to invest in the people, school to teach the people, hospital to save. I'm keynote for Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma next month. And we've been celebrating Tulsa for 103 years. Yeah. Why we ain't replicating Tulsa? Yeah. Why we ain't rebating Tulsa? Yeah. Where's Black Wall Street Baltimore? Where's Black Wall Street Lando? That's what I want to know. You see, it's because we love to celebrate what our ancestors did, but we don't like to pick up where they left off. <laughs> the point that I'm making is Negroes criticizing me for the Frederick Dallas Marcus car. Everybody's an expert on building schools now. <laughs> they know how much the HVAC costs. They know how much the electric costs. They know the insurance bill. They know how to get the water on. They know how to fix the roof. They know everything about my school, but have never built one themselves. Wow. So here's what I say to the FDMG haters. When we do open up that school, don't bring your ass because you're not coming in. Oh, no. Oh, no. The Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Mechanical will only be for Dr. Umar supporters and Dr. Umar supporters only. If you didn't donate, if you didn't support, we don't need you. And let's just be honest. The real reason why a lot of Negroes have an issue with me and my school ain't because of no hustle. We already been audited by the IRS because of these Negroes and we passed with the flying colors. Ain't no crooks around here. You understand? You know what the real problem is? Once the school gets up, all of you are going to raise your expectations for all these other so-called Negro leaders and organizers who do nothing but make YouTube videos. See, they want me to fail so you don't expect more from them. Because they say, wait a minute now, Dr. Umar is more popular than all y'all put together. He's invited to speak around the world more than all y'all put together. He got more videos on YouTube and he even got a YouTube page of his own than all y'all put together. <laughs> He's the king of TikTok, king of Twitter, king of Instagram. He looked better than all y'all looking together. <laughs> He's six foot three with the North Philly Bill, care about the state. Listen. <laughs> Let me speak my speech! <laughs> and Dr. Umar built the school from nothing. What excuse you got? What excuse you got? See, I'm gonna raise the bar when the school get open. So this is not a constructive criticism of why it's taking so long. Institutions take time. What this really is about, we need him to fail. Because if he wins, we will all have to buy down and say, oh yes, he's without question the notorious R.B. <laughs> Black power. Don't hate me! That's you might be. Okay, give me your response. <laughs> Can you Make say some noise, Captain State University! And don't worry, I'm going to take all the pictures at the end. I'm not going to leave to everybody get their picture, all right? I got you. <laughs> and anybody need a book, they in the back, $25 for students, $50 for a regular community, right in the back. Can you talk about money happening, we can't take no pictures. <laughs> you want something else you want to add? Oh, it was, wait, it was the LGBT, it was FDMG, and what was the first one you said? Talking about offering dates. Oh, that wasn't sexual. The date with the doctor, right, is when a queen pays five hundred dollars. <laughs> talking about the notorious one. Listen, and I take her on a date. I pay for the date. She chooses the restaurant, and I pay for the date. Not y'all. I owe them to be your father. Relax. <laughs> Young brothers, handle that. <laughs> Listen. And we go on a date, and guess what? I've had several of them. It ain't about sex. We sit there, we do consultation, they ask about their kids, they give me ideas for the school. Some of them are going to be part of the school because now they're the expertise of what they bring to the table. The date with the doctor is non-sexual. I've never been with any of those women alone behind closed doors. It's in public, at a restaurant, and it's a brother and a sister communicating. Stop. Huh? That because we built an institution, my African princess. You think we want to run that school on water in prayer? You feel me? That, that's, that's a contribution to the movement, y'all. Our water bill is like $2,500 a month. I don't think y'all understand how much money we pay. We about
about to paint the school on May 11th and May 12th. You know how much the paint going to cost just to paint the inside of the school. And by the way, if any of you have donated to the school, or if you will donate to the school, you can come and paint with us on paint day, 9 to 5, May 11th and 12th. Uh, just text me. I'm going to make sure y'all have my number. And if you donate, you can come and paint. And we, I'm going to take everybody to dinner, all the donors, all the paint volunteers. We're going to go to a restaurant at 5 o'clock and have dinner. And then we're going to come back Saturday. Excuse me, Sunday. Saturday and Sunday. 11 to 12, we're having dinner both nights, play some music, have fun, and paint the school. So if y'all want to help paint the school, feel free to do so. Okay? Uh, but, but my point is, guess how much the paint costs? $20,000. For well, the paint, we need like, what he said, we need like 158 gallons or something like that. You see, we talking about a school, not a house. Y'all used to have it in the park. We talking about a damn institution. It ain't gonna be true. So it's gonna be more dates with the doctor. <laughs> Go right ahead, Queen. Thank you. Okay, given your response, can you talk about the impact of the fracture? relationships between black men and women on the collective community. Oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Woo, the black male female relationship. Right, first of all, I want to say this to my sisters. I want to apologize to you. Thank you. Because black men have not been the men y'all needed us to be. I'm not <laughs> Black men economically irrelevant to the black woman. 
Black men are the only men in America who are out-educated and out-earned by their men. No other man has to worry about a wife who makes more or knows more. They did this on purpose to upset the natural gender balance of the black home, and we've been fighting back and forth ever since. Yeah. Brothers, you should not feel insecure if your queen make more money. You should not feel insecure if she got more degrees than you. Because even though the black woman might out-earn and out-educate you, she's still the most vulnerable person in this country. The black woman is more sexually abused. The black woman is more sexually assaulted. The black girl is the most sexually trafficked in this country. So we cannot allow our ego to get so far out of hand that we start looking at the black woman as an enemy just because she makes more money. If my queen makes more money than me, so be it. I'm still the king of the house. She's still the queen. Why are we fighting with black women? And then, brothers, we got to make up our mind. Do we want to be the king or not? Because on the one hand, we don't want to be blamed for nothing wrong with black women. We don't want to take responsibility for the kids. We don't want to take responsibility for the killing. We don't want to take responsibility for the gangster rap. We don't want no responsibility. And then we turn around and say, I need to treat you like a king. A black woman cannot, by nature, submit to a man whose spiritual strength is lower than our own. Your frequency, your frequency. When a man tells me my woman too strong for me, do you know what you just said about yourself? What do you mean your woman too strong for you? And, and the problem with my young sisters is y'all be submitting to men who you know you stronger than. But, 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 he's attractive. He's swagalicious. All the girls on campus want him. He might be weak, but he look good. And so you settle for him because he look good, but he ain't really got that masculine integrity that you need. And so then you end up not even wanting to be bothered with him after you didn't slept with him because your spirit never agreed with his soul in the first place. Okay? Listen, y'all. The white power structure wants us to fight with each other. The black man and black woman have the same enemy. It is not each other. It is white supremacy. And let me say this going back to the LGBT one time. You know who's helping them recruit more than anything else? Black men and black women on YouTube tearing each other down. You want black girls to become, to join the movement? You want black boys to become, and to keep on fighting and tear each other down on YouTube. Nothing hurts me more than to go on YouTube and see black men and black women condemning and criticizing. And black men, I'll tell you right now, I can't respect no black man who gets on social media and tells the world he don't want or respect his woman. There's nothing more disrespectful and insulting for a black man to say something like that when you came from a woman your damn self. It doesn't make no sense. Stop going back and forth with our women. Let them say what they want to say. Black women are angry because we haven't done for them what other men are doing for theirs. See? A woman can only submit to one king. She can't submit to two kings. And black men need to understand this because we're telling her we're the king. But if we're the king, why she got to go beg a white man for the job? If we're the king, why she gotta go back the white man for a home? If we're the king, why she gotta go fight the white man for her son to go to school? The black woman can only submit to one man. So if you don't want it to be the white power structure's kingdom, and you want it to be your kingdom, then start being the king that the queen can bow to. Because guess what, girls? As strong as our sisters act, as hard as they can be, they wanna love us. They wanna submit to us. They wanna honor us. They wanna celebrate us. But God created her in such a way she cannot submit to weakness. So once we become strong, our sisters will come right back on home and be the women we need to be. Until then, be quiet and keep on building. Black power. The black woman is not my problem. Racism is. Brothers, you just know how to treat a woman. Stop being so hard and rough with the sisters, even though they may act hard. You know why she acting all tough like that? Emotional abuse, sexual abuse, parental abandonment. Not to mention, we have overly sexualized our women to the point of no return. When you see a woman walking there, you don't even see a woman. You see breasts, you see ass, you see God. You're not even looking for her, for who she is. Don't you know that whenever a woman lays down, she's letting you into her body, you are tapping her soul. 
and she can't have one after another go inside of her, then she'll be psychologically unhealthy when it's over with. I'm saying understanding the spiritual anatomy of a black woman is going to be key for black men to go back to where we need to be. And we are responsible for the boys. We got too many single black mothers raising boys on their own. That's not acceptable. Why? Because black men in African society are responsible for the boys. Why these boys out here killing each other all the Because we're not out there checking. We're not out there racing. We're not out there putting them in their place. One thing we could do that black women would go back to respecting us again, and you know what that would be? Say, sisters, from this day forward, every black boy in Baltimore is no longer your responsibility. They will still live with you. You will still make sure they're clean and make sure they do their own work and they got clean clothes on and go to school. But black men are now responsible for the social development of black women. If we did that one thing, black women would respect us again. But wanting all the control and none of the responsibility, that ain't nothing but a sin. Black problem. And I want to say this to my sisters. It's not the black man's job to give you a white woman's lifestyle. Too many of your sisters are so materialistic that the only thing you want, you're not looking for a husband or a mate, you're looking for a financial sponsor. And it ain't no black man's job to be your sponsor. Guess what? I could put my woman in a real big expensive house in the suburbs and get her a nice car. I'm not going to do that. Because I'm a Pan-Africanist. I'm a freedom fighter for my people. We are not here to imitate white people's lifestyle. We ain't driving no things. We ain't getting no big house. We don't need to do that because you got homeless black people out here. You got hungry kids on the street. I need a sister who's willing to help me fight in the streets for my people, not somebody who just want to imitate white women's life. And too many of you sisters are looking for men who can finance your European dreams of material comfort. That is not the black man's job. And I want to say this. Brother, don't you let your sister use you for your pockets. And don't you leave with your pockets. And you make sure she understands that you have to prove yourself before you get that type of financial subsidy from me. Don't be no damn simp. Be a man. And I mean that. And let me say this. I mean that. Ladies, let me tell you why the snow bunnies are getting so many of you. Big difference between white college women and black college women. Big difference between white college women and black college women. Black college women want their man in his final completed state. You, when he comes to you, you want him with the money. You want him with the job. You want him with the car. You want him with the house. You want him in his final completed state. White women don't wait. White women will see a black man. Give that brother some therapy. Give that brother. Somebody traumatize my brother. Where does this dude traumatize my brother? Give that brother some therapy or some libation. Listen, the white girl will see a black young man as a freshman or sophomore. He's a nerd, nobody paying him no attention, but she can see he got a dream that he ain't gonna give up till he get it. She can see he's a master in engineering, he's a master, he's already in real estate already. The white woman has an eye for black male potential. She will find him when he broke and hungry, and she will stand by him until he completes his dream. Black women won't do that, some of you, but a lot of you, you're looking at his swag first. You're looking at how he dresses first. You're looking at how he's driving. And as a result of that, although I'm completely against black men money out there, a lot of you sisters are losing your men to these white women because you're not willing to ride with him when he broke. You want him when he's comfortable. The white girls are riding with him broke. And I need y'all right now, sisters, look at these brothers at Coppin State and start looking at him for where he's going to be in 10 years. Stop looking at where he at right now. Because Mike Mike and little Tay Tay, who you never danced with at the frat party, he might be the husband of the future. I'm telling you, that's how it works. When I was in college, I was always handsome. But when I was in college, I 
I wasn't, I was the back black student, you mean guy was the activist, you feel me? So a lot of the sisters, they wanted to frat dudes. And a lot of the frat brothers turned out all right, they was cool. And they wanted the swag boys and the weed boys, and I didn't do none of that. But now when I see some of them sisters, hey, can I holler me? No. <laughs> you had your chance. We done here. I'll get you on water ice. <laughs> but my point is, ladies, a lot of you are settling for the wrong thing, and you know it because it looks good now. Stop living for the day, black woman. Live for the future. And the other thing y'all do, ladies, and I'm talking to you as a big brother, because that's what I am to you. Stop waiting until you're 35 or 40 to settle down. I'm, listen, y'all, I want y'all to hear me, Compton State young sisters. Listen, when you graduate from undergrad, you ain't got to get married right away, but start paying attention to the brothers who are husband quality. And when you get your master's at 23 and 24, start paying attention to the men who are family men. Because a lot of women are putting off marriage and family until you've done all your education. You can't afford to do that because it ain't enough black men to go around, not heterosexually. So as a result of that black woman, you have to get serious a lot sooner. Don't do what the women in my generation do when they 40s. You know what they do? When they're beautiful and young, they want to play the field for them. Yeah. Play the field off of their 20s. Play the field off of their They get so much attention, they can't settle down because they just in love with all the attention. And then that biological clock start ticking on that ass and tick tock, tick tock, tick. And you ain't had no babies, and you ain't chuck denomination healing circles. Y'all need a black sister healing circle on this campus where black women can come confidentially and discuss their issues as women. In our community, we have nowhere for sisters to go and talk about the life of being a black woman. If you've been abused, if you hurt, if you're lonely, if you're depressed, if you're homeless, if you're hungry, where do a black woman go to get support? You go to the church, they're going to feed you doctrine. You go to the mosque, they're going to feed you doctrine. Where can you go? and just be a black woman and be vulnerable for a minute and get some support from your sisters. Nowhere. We have to create safe spaces where black people can process their feelings with other black people without being judged or condemned or having their confidentiality violated. We have too many black women suffering in silence. Now y'all need to create that safe space that they got nothing to do with what sorority you belong to, they got nothing to do with what religion you belong to. We are sisters. Let's come together and support one another. Black men need the exact same thing because we are hurting as well. We don't have safe spaces for healing and to process our reality. That's what you need to be in. A sister circle. And I have a question. How would across gender? Across gender, I think we can do it co ed too. Okay, and I also think we need to have retreats for black couples where we can work on the issue. One of the things I'm working on right now is a black singles convention, black conscious convention. Y'all too young, you gotta be a little old. Black conscious convention for single black conscious people. And then one for black couples to help them stay together. Because black couples ain't got no way they can go where they can find other couples where they can support each other. So those are two things I'm working on right now. Great point, point, great point. Great question. Three points, Queen. Number one, black people, we are living in the most selfish era black people have ever had since we came here. We are selfish as hell. We don't care about nobody but ourselves, our frat, our sorority, our clique, our game. We got to stop that. That's not who we are. So that's number one. Selfishness over collectivism. We are too selfish. Number two, we're overly dependent on white people to finance our activism. Most black organizations are funded by white people. NAACP was founded by a Caucasian woman, right? Urban League, white people was involved in that. So we have to look at the fact that too many of our major black movements and organizations were actually founded by the other side of the aisle. 
if we're going to be successful with our activism, we got to have all black movements that don't allow nobody in them but black people. Because whatever you let other people in is an infiltration. And the hand that pays is the hand that rules. That's an African proverb. There's a book out that I recommend you all read. It's called The, uh, the Revolution Will Not Be Financed. And it's talking about the reason why black people haven't made more progress since Dr. King is because of Dr. King's era, all of the organizations were independently financed. SNCC was financed by the people. CORE was financed by the people. SCLC, the people. Nation of Islam, the people. Garvey movement, the people. The Panthers, the people. Black Liberation Army, the people. Deacons for Defense, the people. And ever since integration came, we started taking money from white banks, white corporations, and the US government. And that ain't nothing but control. We can't get free using the enemy's money to free ourselves. That's the second. And the third is the black male-female relationship crisis is spilling over into the activism. Black women, a lot of them can't serve under a black man. And black men, a lot of us can't tolerate a black woman in leadership. So also that male-female relationship that got to be worked out because it's bleeding into the activism. And the last thing I'm going to say on that, too, is black organizations are highly dictatorial. The leaders want to have absolute control. They're not democratic. If you don't agree with me, I want to kick you out. Some of y'all probably go through this on your campus organizations. We've got an HNIC, big head Negro in charge, who thinks that they have a right to dictate what the whole group does and nobody can say anything about it. we got to overcome that. That big ego is really a little ego. And the reason black people suffer from the HNIC syndrome so badly is because in American history we have been so castrated and so denied the opportunity to show our true gifts and talents that whenever we get a chance to lead, we take it to our head and we become narcissistic. Yeah, I 
Wendy Alpha Kappa Alpha, Pinky Green. Thank you, my brother. I love my AKE, but Kamala Harris is a sellout. Well, go ahead. <laughs> that ain't got nothing to do with the surprise. Go ahead, Quinn. My name is Joe St. George, and actually, I'm not a student. I'm a lawyer, 29 years. Ooh. 29 years attorney, clap it up for the Queen. civil liberties, medical malpractice, but most importantly, medical freedom and religious freedom. Oh. And the reason I'm raising this is I love you. And I value the messages that you've been giving to all of us, young people and older. But I struggle with trying to understand your theology because you say things about religion, and I understand, because I want to sue half of the religious community of abandoning our people around the vaccine mandates. Okay? And I'm representing I have the largest lawsuits against the state of the city of New York for firing all of our African Americans, yes. men yes. and women yes. in the city. Wow. I'm about to call. But one of the main liberty that we have in America that allows us to live and to breathe is the First Amendment. And when you say things about religion, and you articulate a, what appears to be a disdain for religion, but everything that you say is based all on scriptural principle, I need to better understand what you mean by what you're saying, because the First Amendment protects our belief system. And all of the lawsuits that are now against our affirmative action, which is supposed to be a cheap form of reparations, is all turning on the issue of religious, or turning on belief systems. And so I need to understand, because it was, and has always been a faith in God and the Creator. And so I need to understand what you're saying. So could you please give us some better Question. direction? Is there a statement? that I may have made that led you to feel that I'm against religion. Because actually I'm not. And I speak in churches on a regular basis. I just spoke in a church in Orlando, Florida, Thursday. So I'm not against religion. I'm a descendant of pastors, as a matter of fact. I'm against the way religion is used to keep black people disorganized and dysfunctional. What is your foundation? spiritual uh, foundation is I practice the system of Ifa, which is the spiritual system of the European peoples of Nigeria. That's my professed spiritual system. But as a Pan-Africanist, I believe in freedom of religion. Most of my Pan-Africanist forefathers were Christian, Marcus Hall, Christian. Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, Christian. Edward Wilmot Blyden, Christian. These are pastors. Alexander Crump, pastors. Henry McNeil Turner, the first black man to say God was black, pastor of the AME church. So I don't take issue with religion, only how some people use it to weaponize it, weaponize it against the consciousness uh, of Dr. Umar, I don't mean to be disruptive, yes, but sir. again, for the sake of time, um, unfortunately, our last two questions will be this young lady um, on the left and this young lady on the right. Um, no problem. So we got these last two right, and this is what we want to do when they're done. If you want a photo, my brothers, because I'm going to come down to the ground. We're not taking them up on the stage. I'm going to come down to the ground. Our brothers, you're going to line up on that wall. To my left, your right. My sisters, you're going to line up on that wall. To my right, your left. And you're going to have your cameras out. You're going to come to the middle. And we're going to take a picture and get everybody pictured up. And if you get a book, I'm going to sign your book as well. OK? Go ahead with that question. Question one, two, and then photo. I'm a senior early childhood education major from Billy. Please hire me. Billy Dell, submit your resume. My question is, what advice do you have for black women who they had to attain PWIs because they were offered more aid than you? Let me get the key. If the PWI is giving them a full ride or near a full ride, I'm not against it because I believe you should follow the money. But if that PWI is going to cost as much or more, the HBCU, 
And that's a straight through moment. No way it should be going to a PWI or an HBCU. Great question. Last question. Omar, my name is India Johnson. I'm a student judge by senior here at Alpha State University, and I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Chi-town. My question is, I was always told, don't take advice from someone whether or not they're going to be. So, with that being said, what is your relationship status? And if you're not married, why? Oh my God. Great question. Great question. Great question. No, that was a great question. I'm not married. Nor have I ever, or have I taken advice from someone whether or not they're going to be. And I got three reasons why. Number one, First of all, let me say, I'm gonna to have to get married because I'm gonna open up a school for boys. They need to see me level on the system. So I don't have a choice. If I love my mission requires it. But to your question, because it's a good question, and I get asked it all the time. Number one, my lifestyle. I travel. A lot of our sisters, they want and they have a right to have a man they see every day. I'm not that man. Revolutionaries make the worst husbands. So I gotta find me a woman who got a little bit of that Anna Douglas, that Amy Garvey, that Winnie Mandela, that Betty Shabazz, that Coretta King. A lot of our sisters ain't like that. So I gotta take my time and find the right woman because a lot of them want that picket fence, little house on the prairie, white woman in the suburb life. You're not getting that with me. You feel me? My life is about the liberation of African people. So my lifestyle is a barrier. Number two, the materialism and the low consciousness amongst a lot of the sisters who are in my age group is also a barrier. I ain't got time for all that. I don't care about popping books in the air. I'm not doing that. That's the second. And number three, from a spiritual side, is I was told by my priest during the divination that I should not be looking for a wife until my school opens. Because he said, I won't have time for you right now. Too much on my mind. But once FDG opens, that's when I'm going to have my two wives. My power, thank you for that question. I'm going to go down and take these pictures. Wait, give a hand to the two queens up here. The moderators of the game and the NAACP. Listen, I need... Okay, quick, quick, right before they go. I need one brother to volunteer to take the brother's pictures. I'm going to give you a free book for doing that. And I need one sister to volunteer. Okay. You gonna need a sister. You gonna stay here. Sisters, you gonna give it a phone. Click, click. Who my brother? You right here. You gonna stand there. Click, click, pass on. Y'all got it.